Today we're talking about, for the first hour, the book of Esther. Of course, we've looked at all these other books. In fact, all of the history books, Joshua, Judges, Ruth, 1st and 2nd Samuel, 1st and Kings, 1st and Chronicles, Ezra, Nehemiah, and Esther. Of course, if that list were from the Hebrew Bible, it would be much shorter because they did not break Chronicles and Samuel and Kings and Ezra, Nehemiah. Ezra, Nehemiah is one book in the Hebrew Bible. Um, yet... That they broke them up partly because, well, the first time they were broken up is when they translated the Old Testament into Greek in the 3rd century B.C., that when they created the Septuagint, because Greek includes all the vowels. Written Hebrew doesn't. And so Greek took up a lot more room when it was written down. And because it took up more room, it was no longer practical to have all of Chronicles and all of Samuel and all of Kings and all of Ezra and Nehemiah in one scroll. Because scrolls are not easy to manage, and when they get too fat, you know, they're really... So they, that's why they broke them up. And then later on, in the Christian Bibles, um, or the, you know, the non-Jewish version of it, in other words, they continued to have those as separate books in order to follow the Septuagint. Interesting thing about the book of Esther, for instance, the Greek, um, the, the Septuagint version of the book of Esther is not the same as ours. What they did was they paraphrased the book of Esther. They retold the story in Greek. They did not translate the Greek version. And in fact, if you go back to the Latin Vulgate that Jerome wrote, that is when they wrote it in the Latin and it became the official, the official Bible of the Catholic Church, he, they did translate the Hebrew book of Esther, but then he added significant sections to it that he thought that he liked from the Greek paraphrase that was in the Septuagint. So there are a number of ways in which the book of Esther is unusual. One is, of course, um, it, it does not mention the name of God. It's also true that, that Song of Songs doesn't mention God. So there's two books, actually. But Esther is the one they really point to. And Esther was the last book to be accepted by the Jewish people as being part of the Hebrew Bible. The last book to be accepted as part of the canon. And it is because God is not mentioned anywhere in it. Also, again, this, the Greek version of it is not a translation. It is a different... It's a retelling of the story, but... It, not in any way trying to follow along with the original uh, Hebrew version. Um, and there have been different versions since then. There are sections that get added to it. So it's, it's kind of a strange little mishmash of stuff. It's quite an unusual book in that regard. Okay? Uh, the next class, which our next class will start on the, the first week in April, by the way, and it will go until the first week of, Ju of June. There will be two breaks in the next term. I meant to mention this earlier, I'm sorry. Um, we will take a break for Holy Week. So we'll have classes for two weeks and then we'll take a break for a week for Holy Week. Then we'll have classes for two, two weeks and then they'll, we'll have a break for a week while Carol and I go on a cruise. Uh, as I mentioned to you, a friend of ours is celebrating her 60th birthday on a boat for five days and so we're gonna join her for that. But then, we, among the classes we will be studying then, we will have a, a, an Old Testament. Six will be the Old Testament wisdom books which are Job, Psalm, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, and Song of Solomon. The New Testament will be the General Epistles and Revelation. So those two classes will finish out our sections of Old Testament and New Testament, and Systematic Theology too. Okay? All right. Um, so, let's talk about the Book of Esther. Uh, I've already started telling you a little bit about it. These are two paintings. Uh, the one on the right is a painting by Rembrandt of Esther and King Ahasuerus, or Xerxes, and Haman, the Agagite, at, at dinner, at the banquet, right before. And in fact, if you looked at this close, it's a Rembrandt, so it's dark. <laughs> Rembrandt started with a black canvas and then added highlights. That's how he painted it. Um, if, you could, if you get up close and see Haman's face, he's like, <gasps> because it's just been revealed that um, Esther is a, is a Jewess, she's a Jew, and that therefore she is asking the king to do something about the fact that Haman has plotted to kill her. We'll tell you that whole story. But um, Esther has been such a wonderful inspiration for literary, there's all kinds of retellings of the story of Esther, because it's just a wonderful story, I told you. It's, it's my, my, in terms of a, a contained story, it's my favorite story in all of scripture. Um, and uh, just a wonderful, wonderful story. The situation we find ourselves in, in terms of preface for the book of Esther, is that, again, the Persian Empire had conquered the Babylonian Empire in the 530s. Now, this says 550 because the Persian Empire had already begun to grow before they conquered Babylon. 
Um, the Persians defeat the Babylonians, they take the city of Babylon, and since they conquered all this territory, they, they inherited the Jewish people that had been taken into captivity by the Babylonians. So all of a sudden, the Jews are no longer captive to the Babylonians, they're now captive to the Persians. But the Persians turn out to be a very different kind of uh, ruler or, or you know, empire controlling them. They give them the right to return home. They give them the right to worship their own religion, etc., etc. Now, it's almost as though in the history here, you know, the major empires that, that are affecting history during the time of the historical books are, of course, the Assyrians, which destroyed the northern kingdom of Israel in 722 BC, the Babylonians, which destroyed the southern kingdom of Judah in 586 BC, and then in the 530s, the Persian Empire that destroyed or conquered the empire of the Babylonians. And in sort of descending order, they went from most cruel to least cruel in terms of how they treated the people they conquered. The Assyrians were notorious. You know, they loved nothing better than to skin people alive and to pile, see how many heads they could pile up outside of the city that they were besieging and, you know, all kinds of stuff like that. The Babylonians were, were pretty rough in war, but they were a little more gentle with the people they conquered. When they took the, they took, they did deport and take the, the, um, the people from Jerusalem, the Judeans, off into the captivity, but they let them live together. They let them continue to have some freedom, but just not in their own homeland. And they had destroyed the city of Jerusalem and the temple. And then the Persians come along and they say, you can go home if you want. Okay? It's, you still have to pay taxes. We still are in charge, but we're going to let you go back to your, your traditional homes and, and build your own houses and worship the way you want to worship as long as you are, are not disobedient to the rulers. Okay, so a very different kind of change in terms of the controlling powers. Now, um, this is the same, uh, the same map in terms of the outline, but it's easier to see some of the cities. This is, of course, the, uh, Israel, what, what had been Israel, and then later the, the two kingdoms of of uh, Israel in the north and Judah in the south. And you can see several cities there. Samaria was the capital of the northern kingdom of Israel. Jerusalem was the capital of the southern city of Judah. And right here, you'll see this red. It says Shushan. Shushan was one, tra one translated name for the city of the capital city of Persia. We generally see it written as Susa, S-U-S-A, but sometimes it's written as Shusha or Shushan. So it was right here, and this is Mesopotamia. This is the land between the rivers, the Tigris and Euphrates rivers. And so Susa, the capital city of the uh, Persians, was very was in the Mesopotamian region. So it was an area that was well watered, you know, was fertile, etc. Um, and so the city of Susa is actually where the story of Esther takes place, because Esther and her cousin, Mordecai, who's older and who had been her guardian after her parents died, um, they're living in the capital city. Some people tend to think, in fact, I had a couple of questions before when we were talking about the return, that when, as soon as Cyrus said, you can return, that all the Jews said, yay, and they grabbed their stuff and they headed for home. No, they had lived there for perhaps three generations at least 56 years. Um, and so, when you have three generations of people that have lived in one place, even though that you may have not have chosen to be there on your own, it's very difficult to say, we're just gonna pick up and go back. And so, a relatively small percentage overall of the people who were in captivity outside, uh, outside Jerusalem and outside Judea actually ended up going home. And by the way, uh, Esther is also the first book that we, they refer to the Israelites as Jews. The reason being because the only people who were in captivity of the Babylonians and therefore were returning home after Cyrus said they could were people from Judea. And so it's no longer appropriate to call them the Hebrews or the Israelites because that included all the lost tribes, the ten tribes in the north that had been lost by the Assyrian uh, dis, you know, dis, or, uh, distribution of the people across the land. So the ten tribes that were the lost tribes were gone, the only people that were left were people that had come from the kingdom of Judah. And so, because Esther is only referring to those people, this is the first book in which they are called the Jews, which is taken from the word Judah, Judah, okay? So, um, but, so they had been brought from here over to here, they had been there for at least three generations, 
And many of them just stayed there. You know, I gotta sell my house, you know, my car's not gonna make that long drive. It's not possible for me to do that. And we like the school our kids are in. Whatever the reasons were, it was not practical for most of them to go back. Only those that were highly motivated to return to the land of their forefathers. And there was nothing for them to go to. It's not like their, their old houses were still there. The whole city had been destroyed. And so they were going, if they were going, they were going as pioneers from a land where they were settled, they had jobs, they had crops, they had, you know, the kids were being educated. They spoke the language of the Babylonians now. They spoke Aramaic, which is a version of Chaldean, which is the ancient Babylonian language. And they continued to speak Aramaic all the way up until the time of Jesus and after. You know, Jesus uh, spoke Aramaic. Uh, the, the first century Jews spoke Aramaic as the general language. Why? Because several generations of kids had grown up speaking Aramaic. And that was the language that the kids knew because they learned it in the streets when they were in exile, and they continued with that. So most of them did not return home. Mordecai and Esther, in the book of Esther, are examples of two of the Jews that did not return. They stayed where they were, which happened to be in the capital city of <coughs> Susa, capital of the, of the empire. All right? Any questions about that? Hopefully you're getting a little bit of a historical context for you know, what's going on here. This is my usual kind of overview of the book. Um, the author is unknown. Traditionally, it's believed to be Mordecai. Actually, more accurately, um, there was in, in the 600s, 500, 600s, there was a decision to, to, for the, by the Jews that had what was called the Great Assembly. And the Great Assembly decided what books were canon. What books for the Jews, what should be included in the Hebrew Bible? They decided, for instance, that the books of First and Second Maccabees and Bell and the Dragon and the additions to Daniel, etc., were not part of the Bible. Which is one of the reasons the Protestant reformers decided they're not part of the Bible, because the Jews didn't think they were part of the Bible and they were Jewish books. Well, when they looked at all of this, and they um, the tradition was that the book of Esther had been written by Mordecai one of the characters. The Great Assembly took that and edited it, added to it, and that's widely recognized. That's not, you know, that's not something that's disputed. That's not just liberal scholars saying that. And so the Jewish belief is that Mordecai wrote the original document, but it was expanded by the Great Assembly, and the Great Assembly were the ones that were not sure they wanted to admit it to the canon. They weren't sure they wanted it to be part of the Hebrew Bible. And so it was only after kind of reviewing it and adding to it, editing it, whatever, that Esther ended up being accepted as part of the canon. So traditionally, Mordecai wrote the original document. The Great Assembly, you know, 400 years after Jesus, the Jewish people that decided what was the Jewish Bible, the Tanakh, they edited it in order for it to fit in. The date we have here is 460 to 435. Now, Xerxes, assuming Ahasuerus, who's referred to in this passage, is Xerxes, the same king. Uh, Xerxes ruled from 486 to 465, which means since all of these activities, all of these events had to have happened before they got written down, duh, then if Xerxes ruled until 465, this probably was written fairly immediately after that, like 460. And if it's traditionally written by Mordecai, one of the things we learn at the end of, of Esther is that Mordecai is made the prime minister of the whole Persian Empire by King Ahasuerus. And so, after five years of getting things in order, he had enough leisure time to sit down and write this wonderful story of the things that had happened with he and his cousin Esther, or Hadassah, as her Hebrew name. So, that's why we say probably 460 to 435 circa, that's the traditional dates, meaning sometime shortly after the reign of King Ahasuerus, or King Xerxes. Um, the purpose to tell how the Jews were protected and preserved by God, even while in exile. That God is in control, God is in charge, even when they feel like you know, they're a long way away from the promised land, they're, they're, the temple doesn't exist anymore, they're under the control of a foreign power, God is still in charge, and he is still going to protect his people. That's the theme and sort of the purpose statement of this book. One very rough way to outline them, I'm going to go through a more detailed outline here in a second, is... There's a search for a new queen, because Queen Vashti gets up uppity. We'll talk about that. Then there is a plot by Haman to kill the Jews, because Mordecai the Jew is not respecting him the way he thinks he should. Then Esther, at Mordecai's encouragement, uh, develops a plan to try to, to stop Haman's plot to kill the Jews. Haman ends up, you know, 
Heyman's downfall, or maybe, you know, Heyman's hanging up, whatever, however you want to say that, because he ends up being hanged. Um, and then Esther ends up saving the Jews, okay? That's a very sort of, that's an outline you can memorize or remember in terms of the story. Um, let's talk about the, a little bit more detailed outline of Esther, and in the process of doing this, let me tell you the story in case you haven't read it, like you're supposed to, okay, or haven't, haven't read it often. I've probably read the story of Esther a hundred times. Again, it's one of my very favorites. And, and uh, the, the book of Esther is one of the five uh, Megillot, you know, uh, the Megillah. The Megillah is a scroll. So the five scrolls, or five Megillot, um, are the Song of Songs, the book of Esther, the book of Ruth, in not particular order. Um, the, so um, Song of Songs, Esther, Ruth, Lamentations, and Ecclesiastes. Ecclesiastes. Thank you. Went completely out of my head. Those five stories, actually those five books, are read each one at a different major Jewish festival every year. The festival at which Esther is read is the festival of Purim. Purim literally means the lots, the, like the casting of lots, the throwing of dice kind of thing. Purim is the lots. And what happened was when Haman, in the story, Haman, when he and his wife and their henchman buddies decide that they're going to try to convince the king to, uh, to destroy the Jews, they cast lots, or Purim, to decide what day do we want to do this on. And so Purim is a festival of the preservation of the Jewish people uh, from the plot of Haman, and so the festival is called Purim. And at the festival of Purim, they read this out loud. In fact, they read it twice. They read it the night before, and then they read it the next morning. So they read through the whole thing twice. And I've said to you before, that's where the expression, uh, the whole Megillah comes from. It's because they read the whole story of Esther twice, the night before and during the day. And so the kids, I'm sure the kids are saying, oh man, he's going to read the whole Megillah again. <laughs> well, if you've ever heard that expression, the whole Megillah, it comes from the reading of the whole of the scrolls, especially uh, Esther. Um, Esther more often is referred to, because it, Purim is such a popular festival and it's such a great story, um, often you'll hear uh, Jewish people talk about the Megillah. Now there's actually five of them, five Megillah, that's the plural word, Megillah. But when they say the Megillah, they're usually referring to Esther because it's so popular. And strangely enough, and I don't know why this is, that I would like to find out, I want to do some research on this. Most, as you, you've seen pictures of them carrying the scrolls of the law or various other scrolls, you know, you know, because they still have traditionally, they have the, the, um, the Tanakh on scrolls. Well, almost all scrolls have two rollers, and they will unroll one side while they roll up the other, okay? Traditionally, the Book of Esther only has one roller, and they pull it off from that as they read it, but they don't roll it up on the other side, and then they re-roll it back on one scroll. I don't know why that is, but traditionally, the Book of Esther is different in that regard. And so if you ever see a scroll, you know, like a Hebrew scroll that's only got one roller on it, that will be the Book of Esther because it's treated differently for some reason, and I need to find out why that is. Okay, so, takes place in the city of Susa. The Persian Empire, the King Ahasuerus, or Xerxes, is ruling, and it starts out with the Feast of Xerxes. We're told that he has a feast that lasts six months, 180 days. And initially, it's just for his court officials and officers and all those people, but he eventually makes it available to the whole city of Susa. Uh, Susa. Everybody gets invited to the party. And so they're all there, and he's in, you know, King Ahasuerus is in with his, his closest officials and, you know, uh, the people who suck up the most. And he is married to a woman named Vashti, Queen Vashti. And she apparently is renowned as a beauty. Well, everybody's drinking, and Ahasuerus is in his cups and everything else, and he wants to brag about how beautiful his wife is. So he sends words, he sends messengers to the queen's quarters and says, tell Queen Vashti to come out here. I want everyone to see how beautiful she is. And they go and tell the queen that the king wants to see her, and she refuses to come. This is the king of Persia, the king of all kings, he was called. And if you saw the amount of territory he ruled, that's pretty much the truth in terms of an earthly sense. And so his wife refuses to come out when he tells her to come. Well, you don't tell the king of Persia 
that you're not going to show up when he tells you to show up. In fact, you get the sense later, we'll talk about that, the, the rules about appearing before the king were pretty strict. If you showed up without being invited, the standard thing, unless he made an exception just for you, was that you get killed. So they were, they were pretty strict about these sorts of things. Well, Queen Vashti doesn't come forward. Well, the, the king is really angry about this, and so he asks his counselors, his wise guys, um, what should I do to Queen Vashi? She did not appear when I, the great king, told her to come. And they said, you know what? If Queen Vashti is allowed to get that uppity with you, there's not a woman in this whole country that's going to listen to her husband. We better nip this thing in the bud. And so they decide that Queen Vashti is going to be deposed. In other words, she's, she's going to be sent away and no longer be the queen. So they do. Well, the king, Ahasuerus, is now without a queen, and they decide they need, to, they need a queen. And someone has an idea, why don't we gather together all the most beautiful virgins from the whole of the Persian Empire, and you can pick the one you want to be your queen. And the ones that you don't want to be your queen, they can be your concubines. Because he had a harem, even though he only had one queen. Well, they gather all these women up, and they go through 12 months of being treated with oils and perfumes. I know it was just the women, but that sounds good to me in terms of the oil part. Uh, so after 12 months, one at a time, these women were sent into the king. And if he was pleased with them, then he might call them back later by name. But otherwise, they only went to see him once. And after that, they went to live in the, in the, in the palace with the other concubines. Turns out, one of the women that got gathered up in this wide suite for beautiful virgins was a, a Jewish girl. She was from the tribe of Benjamin. Her name was Hadassah, or Esther, as she was known in Persia. She was the um, ward, or sort of the foster child, of a cousin of hers who was older, named Mordecai, who had taken her in and raised her like his daughter when her parents were killed. Mordecai was one of the court officials. And so Esther, when she gets taken in and for a year gets rubbed and perfumed, Mordecai keeps checking in to see how are you doing, how's everything, etc. So, you know, he's hanging around a lot. After Esther visits the king, and he is very impressed with her, he asks that she be made the queen. And so Esther becomes the queen of all of Persia. Now, during the same time, the prime minister, the most important guy in, under the king in this area, is a man named Haman the Agagite. Now, uh, Agag had been the king of the Amalekites. So when they say that he is the Agagite, it means he's a descendant of, the, of King Agag of the Amalekites. Now again, in Persia, there were people from all over because they conquered all these people, right? Well, the Amalekites, it helped, it's helpful to know a little history. The Amalekites were one of the people that the Israelites tried to get by as they were approaching the Promised Land. And they actually tried to negotiate with, the, with all of the people there, the Amalekites, the Moabites, the Edomites, some of them they had real trouble with. The Amalekites were especially nasty because they would sneak up on the Israelites when, after they were passed by and they would pick off the stragglers, the ones who were weak, the ones who were lagging behind. And so they were cursed by God for being so vicious. And so, I mean, they didn't even say, we don't want you here, let's fight a battle. They were only trying to kill the weak, which is not a, you know, not a respectable thing to do. And so the Amalekites were cursed by God. Well, here you have a story a long time later, right? We're looking at 800 years later plus, that there's this guy who is a prime minister of the whole Persian Empire who is an Amalekite. <laughs> So it helps you to understand why it is that when Haman is prime minister, who's honored by the king, the order is given that everyone is to bow down before Haman when he rides by on his horse. Mordecai refuses. And generally they say, well, it's because Mordecai as a Jew didn't believe in buying down to anybody but God. But it's also true that since he's referred to as Haman the Agagite, then Mordecai would have known he was an Amalekite, and therefore he would have absolutely refused to bow down to him because the Amalekites were cursed by God. So Haman gets really mad at Mordecai for being the only one who will not bow down to him, and he says, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get this guy. In fact, I'm going to get everybody. I'm going to kill him. I'm going to kill his family. I'm going to kill his family's family. I'm going to kill his dog. Okay? 
He decides he's going to take revenge on everybody that has anything to do, which means he's going to kill every Jew, every person that belongs to the lineage of the Jewish people because of Mordecai. Well, Haman has access to the king. He goes into the king and says, by this time Esther's already the queen, but nobody knows she's a Jew. Nobody, at least King Zarius doesn't know, Haman doesn't know. And she hasn't revealed that. So, Haman goes into the king and says, King, there is a people within your empire. They don't like you. They don't want to obey you. They have a history of sedition. Salud, bless you. Um, they, they're just terrible folks, and you need to do something about it. You need to get rid of them. And Haman says, I will give you 70, or, um, hang on a second. I will give you 10,000 talents of silver to pay for the cost of you deal, getting rid of these people. 10,000 talents of silver is 750,000 pounds of mm. silver. A talent is 75 pounds. Well, the king says, you don't have to do that. Keep your money. But yeah, go ahead. Here's my signet ring. Why don't you write up the order to have these people killed and stamp it? So the king didn't even really know what he was doing. And Haman sort of tricks him into this. They write up the order. They send it out. That's the point at which Haman and his wife and, and thugs cast lots, the Purim, to decide what day do we want to do this on. And they pick the 13th day of Adar in the calendar. And they send out the edict that on the 13th day of Adar, everybody is to get together and kill the Jews, all of them, man, woman, child, annihilate the Jews completely, and you can have all their stuff, which means there was an economic motivation for people to actually do this, because they got to steal the Jewish property and belongings once they killed them. Well, Mordecai reads this edict. Mordecai finds out about this. You guys mind me telling you the story like this? No, no, no. I love the story. <laughs> <laughs> and so Mordecai hears about this, and he sends word to Esther and says, uh, well, actually, what happens is he he puts on sackcloth and ashes, and he's sitting in an ash heap outside the you know the palace, and word is gets to Esther that you know Mordecai, your cousin and guardian, is in sackcloth and ashes outside the city, and if you're in sackcloth, you weren't allowed to go to the palace or anything. So Esther's worried about it. So she sends clothes out and says, here's some fresh clothes for you to put on. I don't know what's going on, but get, clean yourself up. Yes? Well, if they knew Mordecai was a Jew and that she was his cousin, why is it they didn't think she was a Jew? They didn't know. They didn't know that she was related. Oh, probably. that was still kind of a secret. Yeah. Okay. Um, now, so Mordecai says, no, I'm not going to clean myself up because there's a terrible thing. And she goes, what is it? You know, there's like messengers going back and forth between them. And he sends a copy of the edict and says, and sends message to Esther, as the queen, you need to do something to get the king to stop this. And Esther says, not likely, because according to the law of the Medes and the Persians, um, anybody who appears before the king without being invited is killed. The only exception is, is that the king points his scepter at you, then that means he's making an exception for you. But that doesn't often happen. So you just don't show up whenever you want to in front of king, okay? And so she says, so I'm not going to do it. And Mordecai says, let me make, she sends back another message, let me make sure you understand this, Esther. If you don't do something, all of the Jews are going to be killed. Your father's whole line is going to be wiped out. And in fact, don't imagine that you're going to get away with something just because you're living in the palace. They'll get you too. And if you don't do something, God is not going to let this happen. So God will send some means for um, taking care of the Jewish people. So if you don't do it, somebody else will be brought up. And did it ever occur to you, Esther, maybe it was for just such a time as this that you were brought into this place? I'm going to give you that verse later, you know, this, this, because that's a very powerful one. one moment, but it's perhaps for just such a purpose as this that you were put in this place. Okay, and by the way, I've got all this stuff. <laughs> um, so Mordecai persuades Esther then to help. She says, okay, I'll help. And she says, go, and you and everybody you know, get all the other Jewish folk, fast for three days, no food or water, pray for me, so that I will be able to go in and talk to the king, and if it works, it works, if I die, I die, what scripture says. And so they fast for her for three days, she puts on her best clothes, she goes in and stands where the king can see her, and he points his scepter at her and bites her in. And he says, Queen Esther, what may I do for you? Up to half of my kingdom I will give you. Which, that was a way they used to say it, which means pretty much anything you ask for. Okay, that's the same thing, by the way, that later on, uh, King Agrippa says to 
uh, his Sal Salome, his daughter, his stepdaughter, when she dances for him, he's so impressed and very drunk. And when she and then she says, because her mother inspired her too, give me the head of John the Baptist. But it was the same thing about up to half of my kingdom I'll give you. Whatever you want, because I'm so pleased with you. Well, Esther says, doesn't say save my people. She says, what I want, great king, is for you and Haman, your prime minister, to come to a banquet at my house, you know, my, in my quarters. Um, tonight. And he says, okay. So that night, the king and Haman come to the banquet. Um, and the next night, or, or after the banquet, the king is having a sleepless night. He can't sleep. And so he having trouble sleeping. He gets up and he calls for someone to come and read him from the chronicles of his rule. Okay, Kings back then were very proud of themselves. And so one of their favorite things was to have everything written down that they did that was wonderful and then sometimes read it back to them. Well, I forgot to mention, along the way, early on, Mordecai is one of the, one of the court officials, not a major court official apparently. He had become aware that two of the gatekeepers of the palace, one of them was named Big Dan, Cool name, bigger than, bigger than what? You know, big man. Um, that they had plotted to assassinate the king. Well, Mordecai told Esther, and Esther told people, and they, you know, they grabbed these two guys and hanged them before they could kill the king. And they gave Mordecai credit for it, in, officially, officially acknowledged credit. But nothing had been done for it. Well, when the king, Hazarius, is unable to sleep, and he has them reading these chronicles, like that'll put you to sleep. Um, <laughs> They come, to the, they come to the passage where Mordecai had reported that these two guys were going to assassinate the king, and it turned out it was true, and so they hanged them. And King Hazarius says, what did I do to reward Mordecai for that? And they said, nothing. He said, I have to do something really nice. Well, by this time, morning has come. Haman shows up, first thing as prime minister, and as soon as he walks in the door, he had come, by the way, to get the king's permission to, to kill Mordecai. His wife and his thug friends had said, you know, this guy, you, you're so ticked off at him, why don't you just build a gallows right outside your house the next, tomorrow, get the king to say, let me kill this guy, and the king will say, yes, I'll give you whatever you want, and then hang Mordecai on this gallows, and the gallows was 75 feet high, big one. Well, there's some question as to whether it was a gallows like, you know, hanging gallows or whether it was a stake that they would impale him on because impaling, and, and it can be translated either way. Um, so Mordecai, or I'm sorry, uh, Haman comes into the king, and he's coming in early in the morning to ask permission to kill Mordecai. Well, before Haman can say anything, the king says, Haman, I'm glad you're here. I have a question for you. What do you think the king should do to honor someone he wishes to, to honor greatly? Well, Haman thinks, it must be me. <laughs> And he says, I think you should take one of your own royal robes and put it on this man, and then take one of your own royal horses, have the man seated on the horse, and then take one of your senior officials and lead the man around the whole city of Susa on this horseback, crying out, this is what the great king does for a man he wishes to honor. And Haman could just see himself up on that horse. <laughs> and King Ahasuerus says, that's a great idea. I like that. You go and do that for Mordecai. <laughs> You know, and you could just see Haman was a guy. He's, he's walking around leading this horse going, This is what the great king did. You know. <laughs> well, after he does that for Mordecai, then Haman is just mortif mortified. Okay? He's just horrified. He goes home, and his wife, being a loyal and supportive wife, and his friends, being loyal and supportive friends, say, You're screwed. You are so much in trouble, Haman, the king is going to really mess you over. This is just the start of your downfall, okay? Um, thanks for all the help, friends and wife. <laughs> so, um, the second night, you know, after the first banquet, the, uh, the king had said, so what is it you want, Esther? And she said, I want you and Haman to come back to a second banquet tomorrow night. And I've always wondered if it's maybe just that she couldn't muster up the energy to say what she really wanted, so she put it off one more night. When they come together the second night, the king says, okay, this is great, you know, the salmon's perfect, but what is it you want? And Esther says, I want you to save me and my people from a plot to kill us all. And the king says, what? What is this all about? Who would do that? And Esther goes, him? <laughs> Haman, 
has set a plot to kill all of the Jews. And by the way, I are one. I'm a Jewish person, and I'm gonna, you know, I'm gonna die too. Well, the king is so angry because apparently it seems he's angry because he's been tricked by Haman to kill his own queen, whom he loves. And so he's so mad, he gets up and he walks out on the on the terrace. And when he walks out, again, Haman from the night, the, you know, from earlier, he knows that things are not going well for him all of a sudden after he'd been doing so well. And so he, he goes over and he, it says he falls on the couch of Queen Esther, pleading with her, you know, for his life. And while he is falling on the couch to plead with Queen Esther, Ahasuerus, the king, comes back in, and it looks to him like Haman is attacking Esther. And so he says, you would attack my own wife right here in my own palace? And so he calls in the chamberlains, they grab this guy, and he goes, what am I going to do with him? And one of the chamberlains says, oh, I happen to know that Haman built this huge gallows right outside his house in order to hang Mordecai, the guy who saved your life and that you just honored. So there is a gallows right out there, and the king says, hang him on it. And so they hang, or impale, depending on how you translate that, uh, Haman on his own gallows. Then Esther says to the king, please revoke the order. And the king says, I can't. Even I can't, because once something is, is issued as an edict and sealed with the king's ring, not even the king can, can uh, take it away, can repeal it. It is law now. And so they're trying to figure out what to do, and I think it's probably Mordecai, I don't know if it says that, comes up with the idea, well, okay, if you can't revoke that rule, then make, let's make another one that says that the Jews are allowed to arm themselves and defend themselves when they get attacked. So they do that. They write another edict. It is sealed with the king's seal, uh, ring of seal, uh, sealed ring, and sent out that the Jews have permission from the king to arm themselves, to prepare themselves, to defend themselves, kill as many people as they have to. In fact, they're given permission if they want to kill the, the men, the women, and the children attacking them, and to plunder all of their stuff. Well, it so happens when the time comes, the Jews do exactly that, except there's no indication of them killing children. 500 of the people who were going to attack them were killed just in the city of Susa. 75,000 around the Persian Empire were killed when the Jews defended themselves. But the, the Jews did not plunder. They didn't take any of the stuff so that they couldn't be accused of doing this for monetary gain, even though the edict that had gone out in their support had said they could plunder the goods just the same way the early one, earlier one had said the people who killed the Jews could plunder their goods. But the Jews didn't do that. And in fact, in Susa, after they defended themselves the first time, the indication was that the guys, the people attacking them weren't done, they were going to do it again. And so they were given permission to arm themselves the second day and defend themselves the second day as well. So it went on two days. So Purim now is celebrated two days. Not the one day that originally had been picked by the casting of Lot, but two days because of the two days in which they had to defend themselves in the capital city of Susa. And so the Jews are saved. Esther is more beloved than ever by, by the king as, the, as his queen, and Mordecai is made the prime minister of the whole of the Persian Empire. He takes Haman's place. Now, whenever they do the reading of the Purim, um, the, the Esther story at Purim, they are, they, you know, they have people in costumes, they act it out, they don't just read it, they enact the thing, and, and they have graggers. You know what a gragger is? It's, it's a, one, of, one of these little things you, you spin and it goes like this. Well, Haman is so much the epitome of evil to the Jewish people, they don't ever want to hear his name. And so whenever they get to the part of the story, and everybody knows it, that they say, Haman, they use the noisemakers to prevent you from hearing the actual pronunciation of his name. And so uh, it's always dramatized. You know, they have the costumes and the whole thing, so they, they make a celebration of it. Um, and that is the story of Esther and the celebration of Purim when the, when the Jews were saved from annihilation. Now, this is the, the first formal effort to annihilate the Jews. It has, of course, reoccurred many, many times since then. You know, in the Russian pogroms, in the, the Nazi concentration camps, etc., etc. The Jews have been have been the target of attempts to destroy and annihilate them throughout much of their history. This being the first the, the first recorded intentional, comprehensive political effort to try to destroy the Jews. 
um, which is a pretty good indication that they are the chosen people of God, else why would there be so much effort to try to destroy them, exert it over the years? And I think spiritual forces of evil doing that. John? I have a question, um, and, and I don't think this is silly, but uh, did, did you see the movie 300? Yes. And that, that king of Persia, who is Hollywood done, uh, is Xerxes. Is that the same guy that attacked Sparta that, that this takes place with? Um, I, I don't know my history that well, so I, I just don't know. I didn't know. That would have been, I think, earlier than this. Um, I'm trying to remember the Battle of Thermopylae, and it, that was the second attempt by the, by the Persians to invade Greece. Um, the first attempt was when they burned Athens, you know, they deserted, the, the Greeks ran from Athens, the Persians burned it, but then, you know, they couldn't really do anything else and they went back home. But then the second time they tried to cross over into Macedonia and come down from the north, that was where the Spartans, and by the way, it wasn't just 300 Spartans, there were no, Thebans no, and others that were helping them. Uh, but the Spartans were the most military, you know, the, the most efficient army in the Greek world. Um, that, that was the second effort. And I don't know. What, what, what's it, it says here, it says here, uh, it was about 480 BC. Okay, well, that, um, the time period for Xerxes was 486 to 465, so it is the right time period. Although, you don't get an indication that the guy who's doing and saying this would have looked like the guy in that movie. Okay, exactly. He had like 10,000 piercings and eyeliner and, you know, 15 feet tall. Exactly. And so, very strange um, kind of thing. But, you know, who knows what we do with it. Yes, Pam? Um, does it mention what happened to Harmon's wife? Haman's wife? I mean Haman's wife. No, probably would not have gone well for her. Well, wait, wait, wait. It does, does it? Does it say they, 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 they tore the house down? Tore the house down. That's right. Just remember. Family and yep. everything. Yeah. They were all, you know, killed and buried in the rubble of their house. You're right. Oh, I didn't read that. Yep. I, I, I forgot that. where all the sons were killed. Yeah, uh, all of the sons were killed in part of the retribution of the, you know, there were ten sons, all of whom were killed in the, during the, the uh, battle. When I did, when I read it, I understood they killed them, and then like um, a period of time later, day or hours, then then they impaled them. Would well, they, they may. It wasn't uncommon in those days to hang bodies up. Oh, okay. So in fact, you will okay. remember after Saul was killed, Saul and his sons, their bodies were hanged up on the wall on the wall of a city, Beth Shaan, I think it was, and the the people, the men of another city, at great risk themselves went and took the bodies down and gave them a decent burial. And later on, King David honors the men of that city for having done that, because it was fairly common in those, those days. And by the way, this continued until modern times. When the Mexican government first, you know, first put down the Mexican Revolution, then uh, Hidalgo and some of the other guys that were leading the Mexican Revolutions, they hung their bodies you know, along the... What's that? Outside the Great Room. Yeah. yeah. Um, and so their bodies were left up there you know, to the birds and sun and rot and everything, as an example. So that's always been done. And so I think that some of the bodies, yes, they hung them up as symbols. Um, anything, any other questions? Is that a great story or what? Okay, it really, really is one great Marvin? Just a comment, you know, it's so interesting that after the first day of the feasting with uh, him and, and the king, as you say, we don't know what they said, what they did that day, but it was postponed to the following day. And had, had God not given the king wakefulness to read those, it, that was the key part that put everything together. Right. And, and so God's working is absolutely amazing. We do our part, but without his blessing and his part. Absolutely. And, and it may be, I mean, I, I said, I, I, it, it feels to me as though Esther called him to a banquet. She couldn't quite bring herself to say this. Well, the fact that she didn't say it means that it was delayed for a day. And in the, in the meantime, the king was not, not, as you said, not able to sleep. He has them read the histories. He's reminded of Mordecai. Mordecai is honored. Haman is debased. His wife and friends you know, are going, oh, man, you're toast. Uh, this, this is not good. Um, and so the setting up of the whole thing probably would not have happened if Esther had been able to get it out that first day. So even that, sometimes even our inability to do something in a certain time 
is is God's planning, and and I, not to not to be overly spiritualizing some uh, the procrastination, but from time to time I've had work for Christian clients, you know, and I I found myself just unable to get it done. I, I just can't, you know, either if I'm I'm writing something for them and it's just not coming together, the words aren't working, or I just and I'm thinking, man, I got it. What's wrong with me? And then all of a sudden, I'll, I'll get it. And this has happened to me more times than I can count, literally. Then some other piece of information or some event or something happens that completely changes it. And then without that additional thing, I would not have been able to do it right in the first place. And so sometimes, even though it feels to us like, uh, you know, maybe it's that God is saying, not quite yet. It's, it's so important to me because in my previous Christian life, I was always trying to make God's plans fit mine. Yeah. And, and now I'm going, well, if it's not working, if it doesn't seem right, I'll go with that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Perhaps a very good reason. First Bob and then and then Florette. Yes. Bob, you had a Just a quick comment. It seems like the ancient Persians were a lot more tolerant than the Jews than the, than the current Persians were. Uh, very much so. Well, that this was way before um, Islam. Okay. Like per per Persia is modern day Iran. Okay. And uh, and Iran is one one of the more radical um, mm -hmm. Persian manifestations. I mean there's a lot of different kinds of Iran, sorry, Muslim. There is a lot of different flavors of Islam. From the very secular um, versions like in Turkey to the very fairly militant, Oman or um, or Iran tends to be more militant. Actually, the most repressive of all Islamic manifestations in the world today, guess where? Saudi Arabia, our ally. The reason you don't hear about them is because they're our ally. And they have all that oil. That's why they're, they're our ally. <laughs> um, but we forget sometimes that, that some of the major terrorist figures that we are hunting in the world today are Saudis. Because Wahhabism, which is the Saudi version of Islam, is the most repressive of any in terms of the restrictions put on women, etc., etc., etc. But we never talk about that. So yes, it is. Iran is one of the places that is is a you know is pretty far on the militant end, generally speaking, of Islam, which means that the whole conflict between uh, Islam and Judaism um, is felt there to a great extent. By the way, one of the the cruise that I'm going to be speaking on. I'm going to be, one of the talks I'm going to do is what everyone needs to know about Islam. And then one of the talks is going to be Children of Abraham, um, Judaism, Christianity, and, uh, and Islam. And they all see Father Abraham as their founder. And yet, where, you know, where did they split off? How did that break happen? And one of the other talks I'm going to do is why the Middle East continues to be perhaps the most unstable place in the world and has been for generations. And a lot of that has to do with stuff we did. And when I say we, I mean the Western world. More the British and the French than the Americans, but you know, they were our allies when they did it. And so I'm going to try to get into all that. And I will be talking about different flavors of Islam. Most people don't even have a concept that there's more than one Muslim attitude. But there's, there's way more differences between Islamic versions and branches than there is between Christ Christian versions and branches. You know, uh, Catholics and Protestants are right there compared to Sunni and Shia and Wahhabists and etc. in the Islamic world. They're very, very different. And so you can't have one kind of blanket belief about Islam. Sorry, I didn't mean to get it. <laughs> Florette, you have your hand up. Yes, I just wanted to ask if you had seen uh, the movie One Night with the King. No. Okay. It's a story of Esther. And it was well, it, 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 it's, it follows very, very closely to what you said today, and, Good. and uh, it was very nice, so yeah. I was just going to say... Good. Well, not the there are a number of uh, different mm -hmm. film and, and literary versions. I mean, it's been retold in different settings and all that, but Esther is just such a great story. It has been the object of a lot of attention, and I think several different movies over the years, but One Night with the King, I'll remember that. So, how long ago was it? Uh, is it a classic? About five years ago. Oh, so it's fairly modern. See, there, there was one, like, 50s kind of thing that is considered something of a classic. Yes? It, the the 75,000 that were slaughtered that were the allies of Haman, Haman were they were they Amalekites also that were being slaughtered? Or it doesn't tell us that. Yeah, uh, the indication is that this went out to the whole 
And anybody who decided they wanted to, you know, go for it, you know, the local Jewish guy who runs the diamond exchange, I'd really like to have some diamonds, you know, even if I'm not an Amalekite. And so the idea was that anybody could do that. Apparently, the edict had, you know, the edict that the Jews could arm themselves was also widely known, which is why there were only 75,000 who died in the process, because apparently there were, there were people who thought, well, even if they do arm themselves, we can still take them. But there probably were a lot more people who said, it sounded good when, you know, when it was, we were the only ones who were going to have weapons, but now that they are legally able to defend themselves, maybe I'll watch, stay home and watch the game, you know, because um, the enthusiasm for it would not have been as great, and that's probably why you didn't have more fatalities than you did. Anything else about that? Okay.